This is the March 9th DevOps Lunch and Learn conversation where we took on complexity. It, how much is too much? Um, and are we building systems that have hidden complexity that is okay or not? And that, maybe no surprise, turned into a conversation about Kubernetes and complexity and the patterns around Kubernetes, um, which wasn't all bashing Kubernetes. It was a balanced discussion about are we adding complexity in the right places? how we should consider it, why people like systems that are complex uh, and have a lot of open space for people to add things and where they create challenges for us. So enjoy the conversation. I've been playing, I've been talking about complexity a bit and seeing a ton of, ton of thoughts about it. And we had this thing come up, um, which I've been calling the Jevons complexity paradox, um, where the idea is that we've made complexity cheap there's a whole bunch of hidden complexity in systems. Amazon's a great example, but you can consume a service without worrying about any of that stuff behind the scenes, at least until you get the bill. Uh, as I've been watching Corey Quinn's uh, decomposition of Amazon bills. Um, and, uh, and so normally I think of complexity as like big and scary, uh, but I'm wondering if, I need to reframe the discussion of complexity, like all this hidden complexity is not going to end in big, scary way, right? If maybe we've, we've actually abstracted out a lot of this stuff and it's just, you don't have, you know, you don't have to worry about that problem. Just keep, you know, keep consuming, let it get more and more complex behind the scenes and it's going to be fine. Right. Doesn't it really kind of depend on what your role is? Right. For an application developer, that's probably something that's going to be more true. I, I think it would go ahead. I think it would also depend on how reproducible that complexity is and verifiable. Like no one is going to no one is complaining these days that high level programming languages are bad because of their complexity. Like very few people are like on, unless you're dealing with resource constrained environments like embedded systems <laughs> you're not touching assembly well, actually, <laughs> that's true actually people are complaining big time i mean that's the, the the learning curve to come up to speed on doing cloud development for most enterprises is beyond their reach that's why everyone's heading to low code no code not that i think that's a panacea but yeah, there's a, a tremendous lack of skilled resources across enterprises. Yeah. But, but the point is, like, e even comparing like assembly to C and C++, um, you, you're not arguing that, that the language doesn't give you correct assembly anymore. Like, it might have been a worry at the beginning, uh, if at all. Uh, but these days, like, you assume that instructions that the compiler gives you are correct. There, there are people who are still doing research on compilers to improve the verifiability of that. Um, but it's gotten to a point where you can reasonably trust the compiler. Um, if the complexity at, with distributed systems uh, has the same kind of verifiability, huh. then man, I, I see no reason to worry about it. Uh, but question is more like, do we have the kind of verifiability or is it even possible? It, it's funny because you're saying that and I'm thinking about Node.js and supply chain hacks at the same time, <laughs> which is different, but. It, I, I mean, it, it, it's a different problem space, but yes, the same problem of verifiability. Like we, we talked last week yeah. that, I mean, you, your, your supply chain is only as safe as far as you can verify it. Um, and it same goes for a system that is not being managed as the attack, like there could be bugs and whatnot. Um, if the complexity breaks down, uh, do you have uh, the tools to bring it back up? Well, do you have the tools to figure out where it broke down? That too, yeah. Right. I mean, so when I think about the complexity side of things, and, and there's kind of like 
I guess, a couple of layers that went into these things. Um, yeah. So when, when we're building out the, the automation code um, for the edge stuff, it was heavily based on salt, right? And then Kubernetes as it went into it and the complexity of our salt states, right? Became a problem. Right, so now we're basically trying to normalize, break them up, compartmentalize them, because like literally there was probably only three people that could actually go keep up stuff. Got into that well. Yeah. Um, and it was a big, it's a big operation, right? You know, it, it was federated across 300 sites. And so, you know, that, there's that type of complexity, right? And I think of the complexity of introducing you know, orchestration systems like Kubernetes and then service meshes and functions on top of it, where there's a different type of complexity in that. Um, you know, and within that, there's no one blueprint for how those things get put together. So I, I think it really kind of, what, what are you thinking when you think about complexity? What's in your mind? I, I think of complexity is, is a cost. Right, that that when you build build systems that have a lot of complexity in them, at some point they become right. They 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 approach a breaking point where you can't improve them anymore. Right, you can't fix them. You can't maintain them. They've you know it's you could call it technical debt or you could just call it you know it's it's everything's become so intertwined that it becomes impossible to fix something. Right, you know. That you get a butterfly effect and sort of like, I mean, look, look what happened with um, uh, Amazon service where they tried to expand the cluster. Yeah. It ran out of buffers and caused this cascading failure throughout their infrastructure. Um, and while, you know, they're doing better and better at protecting things like that, I don't want to denigrate their ops team at all. The complexity of what they've built gets more, you know, it's, is growing, you know, exponentially. And so the, the likelihood of other cascading failures, um, strikes me as pretty high or it's gotta be higher, right? It's going to have to keep, it's going to keep happening because of complexity, because of complexity. Well, unless I'm wrong. And that's, I guess, the that's where the question comes back to, or, you know, it, or maybe we, you know, under overstating the, the risk of a complexity of the systems have been coming more and more complex if we created the right abstractions like uh, I, don't, I don't think you understand i mean there, there, there's definitely I mean, it, it's just like two two things that um you know, come to mind you know i, I look at like the amazon edge and, and to me that wasn't necessarily a question of complexity as much as it was scale right well, all things fail at scale okay right and, and then you've got to go back to the drawing board and open another way of, of how you're going to partition that workload off and how you're going to place. I mean, they, they didn't solve their problem. They kicked it down the road. Right? <laughs> right. Get fewer, bigger fewer machines. Nodes, right. bigger fewer bigger machines. Right. So, so they didn't solve the scaling problem. They, they, they kicked it down the road for some period of time, but they've got a fundamental re-architecture that needs to happen. So that, to me, just falls into a, a scale issue. Um, you know, it's not that the, the complexity of the system caused the problem, right? It, well, of that one service, I agree with you. They had a scaling problem. The cascading yeah. failure problem, <laughs> right, was to me what I'm trying to point out with this idea of the Jevons paradox, where somebody's like, oh, I don't need to worry about how I'm doing real-time analysis. I have this service to, that does it. I'm going to make it a core part of my infrastructure. And, and because it's a service, I don't have to worry about it. Um, and, and, this, and there's a part of me that's like, that, hell yeah, that seems to work pretty well. Right? They, they built some really complex stuff, really sophisticated, putting the word complex, sophisticated um, services because they didn't have to worry about whether or not the um, the the they didn't have to build all those other pieces. They could just say, "I need you to analyze this. Go. I need you to put this in a stream. Go." Um, and they didn't have to pay the price for the complexity, and for the most part, 
except for that the one day. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm sort of questioning. Like maybe, maybe the idea that you're, you're building on these incredibly, you know, this, this, this stack of stuff, normally that would set off alarm bells for me, but I'm wondering if I'm overreacting. Is that, you, you see what I'm? I, I don't know if, if I agree with calling it complex. Okay. Um, like for example, the, 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 the cascading failures at Amazon, that was an issue with the system being tightly coupled. But I see complexity as not just being a factor of coupling, but also of debt, like layers upon layers. But if those layers are okay. uniform and you have reasonable separation of concern uh, among uh, components that use different layers, then, mm -hmm. then I don't see that complexity as being necessarily bad. Yeah, I find related so to people... like. Sorry, John. No, I, said, I mean I find so few people that actually would know how to put together a Kubernetes and a, a service mesh and run it. Right. So, <laughs> it, it, which is maybe an argument for going to Amazon, but. Um, you know, I, I, I had the, the VP of our cloud engineering team who was challenging me that Kubernetes was not the main issue. He thought they had that figured out. And so I made a bet with him. I said, let me ask 10 questions. And if they get three of them right, I'll agree with you. He didn't want, he didn't want the bet. He knows you too well. Yeah. I mean, but there's a part of me that wonders. Uh, um, we're gonna we're gonna tangent all over the place because y'all just opened up like six avenues of discussion. But I'm gonna take the low hanging fruit one to me. Um, should is Kubernetes just too complex? Like, could it have been simpler and not require a PhD in, in automation to run? Um, and and will yes. we just see something that's that's solves the you know I, to me right we're solving problems with kubernetes where the problems weren't known when we built kubernetes and so now we're busy you know it, it's we're, we're creating problems and solving them with kubernetes that might not have that could have been built into the platform as solvable as solvable um you know yes. service mesh stuff like that um, i mean go, going back to your, your, your first question yes i i think kubernetes is too complex, but I think that's also because um, Kubernetes is, uh, I don't know how much percent of the time, I, I'm gonna just take a random number based on my guess, 50% of the time, not being used at the scale at which Kubernetes was designed for. <laughs> A lot of Kubernetes clusters are very small. Right. And they just don't need all of these complex communities. This is why things like microcades, K3s, and et cetera, came out, or K3D even. Yeah. But because yeah. in many cases, it's enough to just that, yeah. run run it on a single node. And, and what you really want is some of the features that Kubernetes gives you, like liveness checks, uh, and mm -hmm. the, 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 the declarative configuration, and so on. I agree that people certainly use it in a way that it was not intended to be used, you know? And, you know, the, the whole notion of having a cluster, creating the multi-tenancy issue was to be able to turn the entire data center into a compute platform, not to start partitioning it up, right? And so I, I, I see these news forums where they talk about what's your traditional Kubernetes deployment cluster. Well, I have two for test, I have two for dev, I have two for this, and it's like, you, you just totally <laughs> missed the point of Kubernetes. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, th uh, that's, that's, that's the part where Kubernetes fails in the, in the sense of complexity that, that where, where Rob, you were talking about before, in that it's all tied together by a single control plane, which is why people are splitting it, because they, you don't want your, 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 your dev environment to kill the production control plane. Well, and that it's also a matter of the way the supporting services and the way things are interconnected from a pods perspective and the CRDs and things like that are, are intermixed too. 
Well, I think the control plane gets in. I mean, you, you can put quotas on to protect the, the production servers and make sure they get preference over any other service on it. So I don't think it's a resource management piece to it. I, I think it's the fact that they, the two things, the two whole, I mean, the biggest hole I think in Kubernetes right now is CRPs, right? Allowing third parties to install stuff on your control plane. Now in theory, it's a great idea. Right, but but <laughs> as I said, yeah, having people try and turn FCD into a message bus, that, that's how you take your control one down. Mm -hmm. well, unfortunately, yeah. the CRDs are in many cases necessary uh, because of the design of Kubernetes and, 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 and the decision to uh, not expand the feature set and, and instead have, again, as you said, like, to, to turn ETD into into a message bus and, and said like yeah just just plug stuff in and um, listen for more messages. <laughs> but there's nothing about since since CRDs are managing resources that are defined by the creator. But there's nothing that says those have to be on the control plane at all. Mm -hmm. Yep. It, it could be an, an entirely separate uh, event bus and uh, it would run fine. The question is. Do you run the event bus on Kubernetes, <laughs> or is that yet another stuff that uh, another service that you deploy uh, alongside? This Sorry, is why anyway. clusters clusters running clusters, right? You're you you've gotten to a point. You're like, oh, I'm going to pump all these things into CRDs in my cluster definition and the the apps that are running it. I, I it's I understand the rationale for the design. Um, yeah. This is, but this is one of those places where I'm like, I feels like we just made it super complex instead of right, we're we're using Kubernetes to solve these problems altogether. Um, but maybe I'm overreacting. Maybe it's it's great. You know, I, I like look. I mean, I look at like the, so. Here's an example of of choices or complexity, right? When, when I decide to do my rollout strategy, do I do it in Kubernetes or do I do it in Istio? Okay. Istio actually has more capabilities, right? So there's two different places to kind of basically manage the same type of strategy into, right? Which one do I use? That that's an example of complexity. Would you call CSI also a complexity then? What I call what? I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, CSI storage the storage interface. Oh. So, which basically allows, uh, like the storage provider. Let's say you are using pure storage or or NetApp or whatever, you you install your operator uh, on on the cluster, and it it acts as an storage provider and handles your persistent volume uh, provisioning and uh, and cleanup. Uh, on on your filer. I mean, it, it, it replaces the built-in storage features. <laughs> is it, it, is it, it letting, the, and this has always been, is it letting the storage vendors get away with not solving those problems natively? Or is it just providing an abstraction so people who don't want to deal with the storage vendors don't have to? Maybe there's no. Maybe those are both good answers, but um, I, I mean, from what I understand uh, from reading about the history of, of CSI, huh. it was created by the by the Kubernetes maintainers themselves because they didn't want to continue adding uh, storage integrations for X Y um, yeah. uh, vendor, and just said like here here is a pluggable interface. With, with, with an API that, that you can implement um, and then your code does whatever magic it needs to do on your filer. From what, from from what, I, understand, from what I understand, a bunch of things. Also the networking model was they tried to pull out of the, out of the uh, trunk of the trunk of Kubernetes. So mm -hmm. um, Amazon with their ALBs is not in the, is not in the, um, Live cloud. It's it's in a different it's in a different area. Correct. That's that was they started with a lot of these load balancers in the built into Kubernetes and then they abstracted them out. Yeah. 
And that was, that's been, that's been a long-term uh, hard to do change, right? And the storage, it's the same story, right? So now, you know, you can diff the different storage classes. It's, you know, that was earlier than, the, than, than pulling out the, the load balancer stuff, right? Yeah. Well, but, and you also got Docker shared. Mm -hmm. So, so, I mean, Docker Shim in, in the latest version got deprecated. So, again, going back to your question, Rob, like, is Kubernetes too complex? Yes. Uh, and the developers themselves are realizing that and, and they're starting to, to remove things that they feel doesn't need to be maintained anymore. I would almost say that it's not that Kubernetes is so complex in the way that they're trying to avoid what Docker did of trying to bake everything in. So Kubernetes is just super extensible. And then you have this big soup that you put together of a production deployment that has a whole bunch of different things plugged into it. And that makes it really complex. I agree with that. I mean, I don't find Kubernetes itself overly complex. Okay. You know. The, you mean the basic pod YAML design i mean you spin know up a container keep the container spun up uh, those are i mean that's fundamentally not hard to explain right uh, no. the, the, the the core i, I agree that the, the, the core concepts are are easy the, the complexity is it's effectively hitting from the Kubernetes developer it's the Kubernetes administrator that sees it uh, uh and yes, it, it might not be as com as complex as, uh, say, uh, like systems that a, a large enterprise might stand up themselves if Kubernetes was not available. Um, but I will still argue that it's more complex than it needs to be. So which which part would you get rid of? Um. I would, I would want to simplify the control plane, uh, and this this again goes back to 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 to, to your argument of, of, about it, it it being used as a, as, as a message bus. Like it's it, it it's an overloaded component. Well, I, I think so. I guess yeah. sorry. I guess one of the questions I have, or at least an observation that's coming out of this. Is complexity a surrogate for hmm. misuse of a design? <laughs> In the sense that everything well you said, right, is Kubernetes is great until somebody decided they wanted to do something different that wasn't in the design pattern. So then it takes on a complexity <clears throat> to either shoehorn what you want, right? I don't like how storage is handled in containers and Kubernetes. It's like, well, yeah, because Kubernetes initially was written to not care about that. It was intended for ephemeral operations that didn't have long-term storage requirements. Okay, great. And people went, well, that sucks. I want long-term storage requirements. Oh, well, hmm, how would I do that? So I go and stuff all that into Kubernetes. And then people are like, but you didn't support my storage controller, right? So then they're like, well, crap. All right. So in some regards, right, that complexity that we talk about is merely a, well, we didn't think about it in the design criteria. So how do we handle that? Well, eventually we get to where we consider it less complex, but more knobby. I don't know what you want to call it, but you've now said, okay, well, it's pluggable, so now I can handle all sorts of things, but now it's more complex. I would argue it's not more complex. It's you have more options, which increases the space in which you need to operate, but it's not necessarily more complex. Yeah. And you, so you I, I listen. Mm -hmm. But what this reminds me of, by the way, is, is in the early days of PCs, there was the Microsoft model with kind of the open bus, build your build your card and plug it in, and then it completely closed the Apple model. Yeah. That's what rolls to my head. <laughs> yeah, is Kubernetes problematic because it is extensible and it's left pretty much it completely wide open. 
kind of, would it be as popular if it wasn't extensive? <laughs> I think it depends on who you ask, right? <clears throat> if it if it was, um, if I'm talking to a CIO and they said, hey, I've got this bulletproof system, you developers may not be able to do everything they want to do. What they do do is going to run, right? And it's going to cost you a third less. That, that's a happy CIO, right? Unless there's some business capability that's fundamental. But yeah, you know, most of the stuff that gets plugged into Kubernetes in, in terms of extensions are core business. So this is like, because what you're describing to me, Cloud Foundry was really rocking it for a while about exactly this, right? They would sell to a CIO and say exactly what you said, not everything you need, but the most of what you need, it just, it, all the pieces are there, your teams conform to it and they, they, they rock and roll. So I, I was never a Cloud Foundry user, but the people I have basically, uh, the people I'm talking, I don't know if anyone else here has done it. They weren't happy at the end of the day. Hmm. Would because... the CIO be happy with uh, HashiCorp Nomad? I think there are a lot of happy Nomad users. There's still a lot of Swarm users. Yeah. Even. Yep. Yeah. yeah I wonder. Yeah. And, and Swarm users or, or even Docker Compass users they are more likely to go to Nomad than Kubernetes, just because like, it, it, it gives them the extra features that they want without uh, losing anything that they need. Uh, and I mean, on, on, with Kubernetes, on, unless you're invested in Helm charts or uh, uh, Compos, uh, or oh, sorry, not, not compose, uh, customize, or, 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 or in some cases, JSON it. Um, I, I don't think anyone who uses Kubernetes in production is, is using like manually crafted manifests anymore. It's, it's, it's all template, and the template system built on top of Kubernetes. And mm. so, so the question is: Is Kubernetes adoption now driven by its application ecosystem that like things that you get out of the box or, or is it driven by developers actually wanting to use Kubernetes? Because for example, getting a, a complex system, that's something that is not just WordPress, like, not just a LAMP stack running in, in Kubernetes with Helm charts is a lot easier than, than it is to get it running and, and uh, and the Docker and, and getting it maintained as well. well it's a lot. Good. Um, I guess I, I'm thinking about this in a different path, right? Because now we've substituted discussions on tool choice as a proxy for complexity, right? So I, one of the most hated persons in my life is Norm Abramson. And I don't know if you guys know who he is. He's the New Yankee workshop guy. And he would show Norm you how Abrams. to build yeah. Abrams things. And he would, he would build a very awesome piece of furniture or something in 30 minutes. And he would do it and show you 14 tools that were very specific to the use case he was talking about. And if you had those tools and you had the $200,000 that it took to buy them, you could avoid a lot of complexity. But I, as a person sitting there going, wow, I would love to build that, but I have three tools, right? I have a chisel, I have a circular saw and a screwdriver. I'm like, hmm, to do that, I'm gonna have to do this and this and this and this. And so my complexity went way up. And so part of me is like, some of this discussion is choose the right tool. Right? If you can get away with something that's going to manage containers in a simplified networking environment with no storage requirements or minimal storage requirements, stick with Swarm. Right? But part of me says complexity is brought on because we like the new shiny. Yeah, I, I was, I, I was going to say, I, I'm not, 
Yeah, I, I think some of it was definitely operations. Some of it was definitely engineering. But, you know, there, there is a cool kid factor, right? It could, <laughs> instead of, cool I mean, instead of new shiny and cool kid, which I fundamentally feel an agreement for, is some of it just the fear of being locked into a solution that's too limited, like too boxed in? From that perspective, I mean, because that, that that that's instead of just saying, "Hey, we're jumping on these things because they're new." There's an element of like, "Hey, I'm I'm playing with this, and it's going to keep you know, I'm not worried about it running out of gas." Let me let me ask you a question slightly different, yeah. right? When I looked at Kubernetes, what I saw in it, right, was you know. When we were rolling things on our own, someone had to, for every service that was out there, someone had to basically put HTTPS on top. Someone had to put a cert on top. Someone had to manage the configuration pieces to it, right? Um, and, you know, that was happening across every one of the development teams. And that was going into all of our, our infrastructure as code pieces, and they were recreating the same thing over and over again. And, you know, to me, it was just like, stop it. We've abstracted these things out now. We, we have places to do that. You don't need to spend your time writing that code, yeah. right? So there, there was a lot of things that Kubernetes provided that allowed developers to stop doing things that weren't core to the, the business functionality they were actually writing. So I think there's a lot of good that came with Kubernetes as well. But now it's almost back to bad habits. My impression when I first saw Kubernetes was similar. It was that it would have some simplification because suddenly it was something architected by Google only rather than architected by 70 members of the OpenStack Foundation, which was my big. <laughs> Sorry. So it, it, seemed, <laughs> it seemed like a simplification. But like you said, it, it, it has changed since now. Some of that complexity is necessary. Like if you sell telco customers, they do ask you for the infinite number of settings that Neutron provides. There is no escaping but from that. I, I don't I don't see the Kubernetes complexity coming in from Kubernetes itself, right? I see it from the ecosystem of projects that have been spawned of around Kubernetes, you know, around it. Um, like which ones? Uh I mean, I, 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 spent, I spent some time digging into the cluster API stuff mm. um, before, I backed it, before I backed away, because I was all excited. I'm like, yeah, cluster API is going to be great. <laughs> um, and then I started looking at the, the domino chain of stuff that was necessary to make it work and how hard-coded it ended up. And I, I was like, wait a second, this is not, it's not simpler. Right, there's a whole bunch of services that are that are chained together, and then require Kubernetes to operate. And and it's it's sort of like, hey, it's really cool. Look at what you look at what you all did. <laughs> um, but it it felt and feels really fragile. Now it's created a nice abstraction layer, right? I mean, we had the same problem with Docker Machine. It's not that different than Docker Machine, um, or even Cop. You know, Chaos. You know, I, I keep watching these patterns over and over and over and over again, and they can work for one thing. They get hardwired in, they do that one thing, they work that one way. Um, and I, I realize I'm saying two different things. It's like, hey, I, I want, needs to be flexible enough to handle real life situations. It can't be too simple. Um, I think that's just a maturity problem, right? I mean, so when we started building out our cloud platform, right? Mm -hmm. we, we couldn't build it all at once. We picked a very narrow slice of what we're gonna build. You know, and, and you know, we for as a classic example, we said no, no local storage, <laughs> right? We're only going to support applications that don't require local storage because you 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 have to mature the platform over time. You can't do everything all at once. I think Kubernetes has done a pretty good job of building interfaces that then allow extensibility as as the platform is matured. Um, so. Yeah. 
Uh, as someone that works with storage, I would say for storage, I, I share that impression. Yes. Okay. The one, Go ahead. But the one thing that, that keeps bringing me back to Kubernetes, um, which, I mean, I, I've tried, I mean, I, I've, I started with, with, with VMs. I, I moved to Docker. I, I, I tried Kubernetes and, and it stuck with me. And then I, uh, I switched positions and, and I started from scratch again. And the one thing that brought me back to Kubernetes there was the ability of Kubernetes to automate the eventual consistency uh, of mm. of the of the of the stack that I'm deploying. Like uh, when 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 I when I switch positions and, and, and I started deploying stuff in VMs with systemd again, and then I was missing health checks. So I was like, okay, I'll I'll I'll, I'll do swar a one node swarm, and then have my health checks again. And, and then it's like, okay, I'm missing readiness checks. I'm missing this and that. And, and Kubernetes yeah. gives you that, and it's it's hard to let go of it once you're used to it. That's a really interesting. It's so what you're describing to me is the standardization of the reconciler pattern. Yes, right. Yeah, it, right. It, the, the, the Kubernetes has provided a reconciler that we can use in generic ways. Yeah. Kubernetes is a set and forget system. Like I, I, I de deploy my my manifest say or either by health mm -hmm. charts or or, or 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 whatever customize. Uh, and, and says, I want this. And Kubernetes makes it happen. And if something dies, it fixes it. Uh, sure, I get an alert. But by the time I log in and make sure everything is, is, is running, it is actually running again. You're, you're, to me, making part of the argument of there's complexity here but there's an abstraction that was created that allows me to not worry about it as much. Yes. This is right. This is, I mean, I, I think we're all like, ah, Kubernetes, it seems really complex, but then, you know, the, the, the question I, I have from the start is maybe this complexity is not as expensive um, as, as, you know, it feels like, you know, it, it feels like it is, or it, it's, it would be in the past. Let me, the, the, the question uh, is whether keep, you need coming, the complexity or not. Okay. Well, but but it's it's super. I mean, I was talking to somebody and they're like, "Oh, I really like this." You know, um, it was a uh, CRD. It was an operator that they 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 bought a service or they used a service, and then the service exposed an operator, and then that's and that operator then created. They they didn't have to worry about the service. They they just consumed it through the operator. And they were super happy. And I'm like, how's that better than just having an API, just using the, the services API? Um, and the answer was, I, it's all in Kubernetes. Hmm. Right, Kubernetes is well, taking care of that only, for me. It's only better if the operator is, is managing the, the full life cycle, right? Not, not just a single API call. Yeah. I think so yeah. So, so uh, the, the difference there, I, I think, is that what's the lifetime of the, the lifetime of the um, the resources to use on that service? Do do they use uh, do they create the, their the resource once and then continue using it? And with, in that case, the API would be simpler. But do they do, are are they a multi tenant uh, either running a multi tenant product that needs to create a new new resource from that for that service every single time and then clean up after it's done? Yeah. Then maybe the maybe the, the Kubernetes operators might do that. You can still do it with with, with your with with the API calls, but what what you lose is the reconciliation when communication breaks down. Kubernetes does the retrying for you. Yeah. So let me ask a question in a totally different way. Cool. All right. What what we're talking about and, and what I found, um, you know, and, and whether it's business or technical, right? There's certain patterns that 
work, right? How you put these systems together, right? How you're you're going to scale these systems into it, um, and yeah, the the people that understand those design patterns, in my experience, are pretty limited, right? What works, what doesn't work, and I, I think, you know, you. you as my question is, is this really a failure of Kubernetes or is it a failure of the fact that we don't have good design patterns that say, here's how you should go implement something in this environment? <laughs> it, interesting. I was actually going to call it a success of Kubernetes, not a failure of Kubernetes. What, no, I'm what not you're blaming Kubernetes. I'm simply saying that, you know, that, that if I tell you to go write a microservice, right, and, and uh -huh. you come back and give me a monolith, right, it wasn't a failure of the compiler. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so what, what I'm, yeah. But it, it might be a failure of the tooling that you put around the systems so that you could manage a fleet of microservices in a comprehensive way. I mean, look at what, Netflix, and, and this to me is sort of the point. Netflix went out and they had a, an architectural challenge in that they had unreliable services and they built circuit breakers and you know uh, chaos monkeys and all sorts of stuff to basically build patterning around microservices architecture for scale. And then once that pattern was figured out, people copied it. And, and so figuring out the pattern to, this is where I thought you were going, figuring out that pattern is hard. Once you've figured out the pattern, a tool that reinforces it, that, that, does, that, that means that the, it's a proven pattern, right? Or it's a reusable, copyable pattern. Part of the problem is that that pattern is proven and reusable for that particular environment. <laughs> Once you have a, a, a different environment, uh, your pattern doesn't quite fit anymore. It's not exactly a square peg round hole kind of not fitting, but like you, you, you get a little bit of, you, you need to put in a little bit of force and, and then, I mean, you wear it off, you, you wear off the peg a little bit and, uh, <laughs> eventually like once you iterate over that, you do end up with with the original square peg in the round hole, but the square peg has been worn down to the round, or, or or at least rounded. Uh, I, one of the things that Kubernetes had in its favor is that it threw out all of that. So it's like, okay, we're starting from scratch. Hmm. Um, the the patterns or the paradigms that came out of Kubernetes, they go they they went against all of the what was considered best practices at the time. Sure. Like, like restoring your service by deleting it. Like that's like completely getting rid of persistence. And yeah, um, immutability. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it, it used to be that that you would try to to set up your servers so that it was basically bulletproof. And Kirina said you don't need to care about bulletproof. You, you just need to care about reproducibility. It doesn't matter if, if your service is not bulletproof. It doesn't matter if your node is not bulletproof, if if you if you treat it like cattle. So, I mean, yes, you, you had containerization before that with, 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 with Docker and, and Swarm, but uh, I mean, if you were running just Docker or Docker Compose, um, so on, unless you were really invested in Swarm or, 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 or Mesos uh, at the time, um, yeah. you were still setting up your VM or your, your, your instance and deploying Docker in it, and you were treating it as immutable infrastructure until it went away and, and then you needed to, to redo it. Kubernetes abstracted that. I don't think that uh, we saved complexity in the end. So we saved complexity for the Netflix user, maybe, or at least we found a solution for the Netflix user. You want to scale out, we do it this way. We use microservices, we destroy the service and create a new one. 
but going back to what we we're saying before, there are these users that use Kubernetes to, to serve a website or to the last example, um, uh, people using microservices. I think that you shouldn't be using microservices unless you have a note from mom with permission. <laughs> you have, most people are not trained to be able to design even a monolith and now we're telling them to design microservices. And most people don't have a staff large enough to require microservices today. Yes, they may require microservices when they have 200 people designing this thing. Hmm. But if they have 20, do they really need microservices? Um, so uh, my take is that there is complexity. And the question is whether the complexity is warranted. And where is it warranted when you're not Netflix? Because Amazon, Netflix, Google, that's all fine. But there is six of them. For the space in the middle, and I, I have to say that uh, my employer is, uh, is to blame because we sold $34 billion worth of Kubernetes to IBM. But uh, is, Kubernetes is not the solution for everything, right? So the line for me comes where you're saying, okay, the application is up to this point and it has a certain amount of complexity and that is a problem of the application designer. Below this point is the infrastructure. And it could be Kubernetes, or it could be Amazon AWS, or Azure, or who knows, Alibaba. If you're deciding that you're taking on ownership of the, in the shared responsibility model that Amazon li loves so much, if I'm deciding to take over the shared responsibility that otherwise I would be paying Amazon to take over, I'm taking on complexity, and that's fair but how much complexity is it for my use case? Is it worth it? That, that's the question for me. Um, and if the complexity is 20, 30%, uh, we, uh, meaning Red Hat, think that we can sell the customer using a hybrid solution or data center solution over AWS. Right. But even us, um, I think we are pretty much on the record saying that if the complexity or the cost is over 30% higher than using public cloud, it's not going to go anywhere. Nobody will buy it. Nobody will deploy it. So that there has to be a reasonable amount of price that you're paying for controlling your own destiny to a higher degree. Sure. But I think you're trading off an example. Um, well, there's two things you said. One, one, you talked about that they don't know how to develop properly in a monolith. Right. So why am I giving them more challenging environments? That's a skill set issue, which I agree with. Right. Um, you know, but the, the other thing is, you know, you're talking about team size. Why, why do we go to microservices? Whether you're the, you build it, you run it, you know, full, full oh, cycle. Uh, of yeah, or not. It's, yeah. It was organizational complexity, right? Yeah. Yeah. You get, you get 10 teams all having to put something together. Right. And you get these long waterfall schedules. And, and that's what was killing the, the development velocity. So you're, you're trying to solve as much an organizational problem as you were a technology problem. Yes, if you have 10 teams, it's very applicable. The opposite argument to that is that if you have 18, team, 18 people, that's three, uh, three pizza teams, three pizza-sized teams. <laughs> and so do you still need... <laughs> Do you still need microservices there? And where, where does it flip over, right? And at that point, you want to start thinking about architecture more than your organization, I agree. But, but I mean, I, to me, the, the whole idea with the pizza teams is that you're, you're fundamentally saying, I've got teams that don't have to worry about what other teams are doing. Right. Right, yeah. that's, that, that's part of the, you know, you're like, hey, yeah, work in your bubble. You don't have minimal coordination, go. That's a, that's a, you're assuming that somebody else is taking care of a problem for you, right? You're, you, uh, you simplified your organization in a way that says I've reduced my interconnects, my interdependencies, right? Yeah. 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 But I think the way they phrase that's slightly different. It, it's, it's loosely coupled, highly coordinated, <laughs> right? So they're, they're assuming that there's good communications between the various service teams in there. It's not like you run with blinders on. Hmm.
I think the loosely coupled piece has come up a couple times in the in the conversation, and that's maybe something that that is the I mean that's part of the the, the benefit that we're here. If if we have loosely coupled systems, then you you don't care about the where the complexity is. Well, on, the, I think on the other side of that boundary, right? To an extent, you cannot care. You can't. I mean, when we're designing our, 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 you know, message bus, you know, on a global scale, right? We, we you know, that, that was a group and they had their roadmap. They got influenced by other people on the roadmap, right? Other teams may ask for things into it, but that group just was responsible for the message bus. Right. And they had a clean API and you were able to say, your job is to scale this. I don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Right. No, I, this, this to me is, is the, I keep coming back to some of what we've been building are ways that say, I don't have the cost of complex, the cost of complexity has been absorbed by decoupling the systems, by patterns, business practices and patterns that allow me to, you know, make some assumptions, the reconciler pattern by saying, hey, yeah, I need you to make this change, just go implement it, I don't care. Um, and if those are saying is, yeah. is that I think what you possibly try to get to is we're we're trading one complexity for another. Okay. Right. As organizations scale, and I have large organizations and I've got lots of silos, I have huge amounts of complexity to manage those development problems. Right. And, and if I can decouple those and add the complexity into the platform side of things. That complexity is probably at a lower cost than the organizational complexity. Sort of like just-in-time inventory is what you made me think of in this case, right? If, if I switch to a just-in-time inventory system, I all of a sudden don't have to worry about warehousing and inventory quantities and location and placement and pick. I just like, here's the pieces you need, drop them off in front of the, in front of the workstation and, and you're done. Is that a, is that a, you think that's a reasonable analogy, but then you're depending on a whole bunch of supply chain stuff that also has to happen. It's, you're just moving, you've moved the needle from where, where you're, where you're worried about. Well, I think if, if you can decouple the systems reliably, <laughs> that becomes less of an issue, right? Right. It, it's when you can't get to a level of reliability that the problem set in. All right, I see I got some guys here, I got to drop guys, but interesting, I, I, I do kind of like that. You know, I think we're just trading one complexity for another is probably not a bad way of thinking. That's, that's what I'm, I'm trying to figure out uh, and if it breaks. All right, catch you next week, guys. Thanks, John. That's, that, that's the thing that I'm, I feel like we've been able to build much more complex systems than I remember building in the past. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I guess I'm thinking about the Texas grid and failed all over the place for silly, you know, not silly reasons, for interdependency reasons that people didn't think about, um, right? We lost, we lost water here because the, uh, uh, pumping stations didn't plan for a prolonged outage or they had, you know, they, they had an outage that was long enough that they, they couldn't maintain pressure or they, something froze up and then they, they couldn't, they didn't have the power to thaw it. Um, and are, are we, are we, how close are we to that in an IT perspective? Here's a question about Texas though. Look, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the Texas grid is isolated from the rest of the grid, uh, the U.S. grid, from, from what I understand. It is, so is, is this then a problem of complexity or a problem of lack of complexity? Like, would adding complexity by connecting it to the rest of the, rest of the grid have <laughs> turned this from a week-long problem to a minute-long problem? 
Um, this is a great example of organizational dysfunction. So the Texas grid isn't connected to the rest of the US because Texas didn't want to deal with US regulations in, its, in governance of its grid. And they were big enough, were big enough to uh, deal with that. Greg, you have something to add to that? Yeah, there's also a uh, technological problem. If you were to do that, um, you will blow out a whole bunch of other sections of the grid. So according to some of the guys who study this, like at Rice University and stuff, their issue was, sure, we could have, but okay, so when Texas spiked, you would have lost, you know, Kansas. And so you would have taken and taken a regional problem and potentially pushed it to other problems because transferring that quantity of electricity around is not really possible. So you're saying this will have been uh, like the uh, the big uh, northeastern blackout of uh, geez, what what year was it? I was That's right. in the nineties. Mm -hmm. That's right, where they couldn't uh, transfer power around because you just can't transfer that much power around. Uh, as I, was, uh, I, I wasn't thinking nineties, uh, Rob. I was thinking like uh, was it two thousand three, two thousand four? Yeah, there I, was, think there was, was, I think it was two thousand three. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Most of the northeast went dark because of a transformer that tripped off, uh, had a cascading effect. Yeah. I, I mean, sure, yeah, and that was a problem with complexity in, in, in that things were too tightly coupled and, again, there, there was no circuit breaker. Um, but, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, it's it, it, the thing, at some point where there's a circular, it, it, at some point it goes in a circle, right? If the systems are always built when they're up, um, yeah, we're, <laughs> it's, it's possible that there's no way to start them if they all go down. But if, if John was still here, he would say like, it, again, he would repeat like everything breaks down at scale. Scale is, and that, well, that, and that's, and then maybe this is the closing thought and then we, we, just, we should wrap up. Um, is in the systems that we're building, we're inheriting scale problems that we don't aren't aware that we're inheriting. Is is one of the things that that occurs to me. See, I, you don't even see it, you, but there's a scale problem, and you're not aware of it, Greg. Right? Well, I think we have to be. I mean, with the grid problem, I think you have to differentiate scale problem versus systemic description, right? In the sense that the systemic failures are what kind of led to the Texas problem. But you could point to rolling blackouts in California where that, like in the summer, where that's a, a we don't have capacity. So that's a scale problem, right? One is a scaling problem. One is a systemic problem. And different to differentiate between those, right? Texas had all the capacity it needed, right? It's just each capacity generation system failed. Right. That's a systemic problem. That's not a scale problem. That's right. Because, right. right, from a generation perspective, within three days, the state was generating over 100 gigawatts and only consuming 40. Right. Yeah, they, there, so was, like, there was plenty of capacity in the grid to meet the right. demand. It was that's like right. a nuclear plant went offline because a sensor froze in an outtake valve and it shut the plant down. Um, those are right. And then the, the nuclear awesome. plant was offline for scheduled maintenance. No, it with was the, a this whole mess. Pipe. Oh, it was a frozen pipe. No, it was a sensor that wasn't heat resist that didn't have a heating element in it to make sure that it could not freeze itself. The pipe didn't freeze, the sensor froze. Right. I think the whole Texas grid though, all these things point to a fail to prepare for a unlikely but potentially catastrophic event. Yes. Yeah, the question is how much do you, right? This is back to the whole, is it a systemic problem versus a scale problem, right? Do you, do you plan to withstand 80-year events? 
Okay. Let's say if you're talking the whole state's power grid, probably. <laughs> but other things, you know. that's the question, is it worth it? Maybe. I, mean, I had to deal I, with the consequences. Uh, I was not pleased. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I live in Austin, so I did too. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not happy with it either, especially since some of the things that they talk about are very cheap to fix. Some of them are not. Yeah. But doing some of the cheap ones would have actually been a, enough to probably keep more people online and therefore hmm. dissuade the systemic failures, right? Because that's really the cascading effect is what's the problem. Oh, boy. There's another interesting point in here about thinking of things as utilities because the cascading failures are partly based on the fact that we assume that 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 electricity is a reliable utility. Well, it's back to your services mechanisms, right? As you're talking about in this system, right? I want a microservice, I want a microservice. Well, okay, you've now tied yourself to the reliability of those microservices. And the supporting infrastructure around them, right? Of course. So, all right, everybody, we're over time. Um, I've been at my computer for over two hours, so I'm gonna call the end. I appreciate the conversation. I, I hope it was interesting to everybody. I, this is something I'm really wrestling with, so I, I appreciate the conversation. Thank you all. Talk to you soon. And Frederico, it's good to see you again. Thank you for listening to another the Cloud 2030 podcast. Once again, these are great shows. We really enjoy the round uh, conversation and we're taking on some really big subjects for our community. You are welcome to join us at the2030.cloud. We talk about these topics biweekly and um, we have a really good time with it. Please come in. We want to hear from you.